Happy Lord's Day. Man, what a week. <laughs> Glad to see you all in the uh, electric lights with heat. This is great. <laughs> Praise God for that. Oh, man. Well, happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. We have many reasons and ways to give thanks today, every day. But it's a special week for us as we look forward to this Thursday. Um, I thought it would be fitting for us this morning in light of Thanksgiving being this week um, to study together the only psalm in the entire book of Psalms with the inspired title, A Psalm of Thanksgiving. So, if you would, please open your Bible to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Throughout church history, the psalm has been known as Old Hundredth because it has been a faithful psalm for saints to go back to again and again and again because we need it and because we love it. As you can guess, the theme of this psalm is the giving of thanks to God. So you can follow along as I read our psalm this morning, and if you are able, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Psalm 100, hear the word of the Lord. A psalm for thanksgiving. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. You may be seated and pray with me. Father, we desire to give you the thanks that you are worthy of and yet try with all our might we would still shall fall short of what you are worthy of. If every man, woman, and child you have ever created gave you praise their entire life, it still would fall short of the perfect praise you are deserving of. Because you are infinitely good, infinitely perfect, infinitely glorious, Lord. We pray, Lord, that as we study your word this morning, that you would enlarge our view of you, that you would hone and correct our thought of you, that you would instruct our hearts in your worthiness and therefore and thereby change our day-to-day -day lives, our thoughts, our words, our actions, shape them to be more fitting of kingdom citizens of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Lord, Worthy are you to receive all glory and honor and power forever and ever. Tune our hearts to sing that this morning, we pray. Amen. Well, in case you walked in late or the bomb cyclone has completely reset your calendar, this week is Thanksgiving week. The American holiday of Thanksgiving. It's a wonderful time for us. We love this. We eat pumpkin pie. We gather together. We enjoy the common graces of God and the particular graces of God in Christ. In fact, many of you may have traditions. Many of you may have relatives visiting or you're planning to visit other relatives or you have your own ideas of how this Thursday will go. Consider thanksgiving with me as an idea, okay? The, the word thanksgiving in our country 
has become synonymous with the idea of sitting around a table, eating a large meal with family. That's a beautiful picture. And I know that admittedly not everyone's Thanksgiving is going to look that way. Not everybody's Thanksgiving looks the same. But that's the picture of an American Thanksgiving. Family, prayer, turkey, stuffing, and a vague fondness for pilgrims and cornucopia. And I hope that for you here today, as the Lord's redeemed, Thanksgiving is not merely a foggy notion of satisfaction with one's own life. I hope that Thanksgiving is a specific giving of thanks to someone. The Lord God, specifically. The God of the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord. Maybe some of you have traditions where you go around the table and you discuss together what you're most thankful for this year. Maybe you pray together. Maybe you sing songs together. Or maybe you you read something together. Whatever the case, I pray that Thanksgiving this week is a Godward holiday for you and your family. But you don't need me to tell you That the giving of thanks to God is an act to be constantly engaged in year-round. Not every third November, every third Thursday of November. It is a timeless activity for Christians, the giving of thanks to God. In fact, our psalm, Psalm 100, was written thousands of years ago, long before the Mayflower. Long before pilgrims and Puritans, it doesn't give a special occasion, but it still calls us to giving thanks. This psalm sounds to us a timeless call to joyful offering to God in gratitude for who he is and what he has done. So I like to think of the Thanksgiving holiday not merely as a day to be thankful on, but a day on which we sit in the school of thankfulness and spend the rest of the year applying the lessons we learn. Said another way, we should be making the giving of thanks to God a day-to-day, moment-by-moment practice of our life. We're going to consider today why and what we give thanks. And what better way than to hear from the Lord, Scripture's own psalm of thanksgiving. Charles Spurgeon once said about Psalm 100, Let us sing the old hundredth is one of the everyday expressions of the Christian church and will be so while men exist whose hearts are loyal to the great king. In this divine lyric we sing with gladness the creating power and goodness of the Lord, even as before with trembling we adore his holiness. End quote. You can ask the youth, I'm a sucker for a good Spurgeon quote. Uh, But I love this because this psalm, in other words, should be etched in our hearts to instruct us that we should give thanks and why we should give thanks. This morning, as we spend our time in this psalm, we're going to be discussing two fitting offerings to bring before the Lord. It's a simple outline. Two fitting offerings to bring before the Lord. I frame this up as two fitting offerings because the most obvious place for our minds to go when we think about the holiness, the righteousness, the perfections of God, when we consider his mercy and his grace toward us, our minds go to the thought, what could I ever give to my holy Savior in return for his loving kindness towards me? could I ever give in return? And that thought hopefully comes from a place of genuine humility. But I thank God that he has actually told us what he wants in return. He has told us exactly what he wants in return for his saving grace. The author of Psalm 100 give us just a few instructions to meditate on this morning to that end. The first fitting offering to bring before the Lord is this. What could we possibly offer the Lord? Joyfully 
key word. Joyfully give yourself to the Lord because he is God. Joyfully give yourself to the Lord because he is God. Your outline might say good. That's a typo. (laughs) Because he is God. Notice I said because he is God. And we're going to see this morning that our offerings to God are given in light of who he is. Who he is. Specifically, in verses 1 through 3, we're going to see that shouting to the Lord, serving him, entering into his presence is motivated by the knowledge of who God is. The knowledge of who God is. Verse 1, shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Shout joyfully to the Lord. Literally, make a loud shout to the Lord, Yahweh. This loud shout, we we know this to be a glad shout, or as the New American Standard says, a, a joyful shout. Because the context clearly calls for a joyful shout of triumph. And this word is used often in this way. For example, Psalm 81 verse 1, the same word is used says, sing for joy to God our strength, make a loud shout to the God of Jacob. It's a triumph shout. And this verse, verse 1 of Psalm 100, is the verse that we jokingly refer to when one of us can't sing very well, and we say, I may not be able to sing, but at least I can make a joyful noise to the Lord. Uh, Psalm 100 is not about Well, this verse is not primarily about singing. I like the sentiment of a statement like that because it's true. The Lord does not care about our command of musical tone. He cares about a heart that exults in him. A heart that makes glad shouts of joy over him. And that is exactly what this word is. This is a shout of victory. This is a shout of rejoicing. This is a shout that rings through the streets when the king has conquered his foes. It is a shout of cheer. When the prophet Samuel installed a king over Israel, the same word was used. 1 Samuel 10, 24 says, Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? Surely there is no one like him among all the people. So the people shouted, and said, long live the king. It's a victory shout. Right away, this song confronts us. It confronts us by way of command. Verse 1, shout joyfully is, that's a command. That is an instruction from our Lord. So we're confronted we're left to ask ourselves, Christian, do you cheerfully make joyful shouts to the Lord for what he has done? For who he is? Is the disposition of your heart in this season of life, this season of life, is the disposition of your heart gratitude and cheer? Is it? It should be, but let's be honest. So often our hearts fall short of the joy that we should have in the Lord. So what do we do when we do fall short? Where do we go from here? How do we get there? We're going to see at different points in this psalm that there are motivating reasons behind each act in this psalm. This each Command in here must be fueled by a right understanding of who God is and what he has done for us. Do you have gladness in your heart regarding our Lord, our Master? Do you have gladness in your heart? Frequently, we're content to just be resigned to be the Lord's. Just, yep, circumstances be what they are, but uh, I'm the Lord's. We should be glad of that fact. And if you lag behind this morning in rejoicing, 
let's shore up our convictions today together. Let's look together to the Lord and let's tune our hearts to the joyful shouts that we ought to have before him. And let's do it together. But first, let's acknowledge the obvious in our verse. Notice that this loud, joy-filled shout is directed to someone. Yahweh God, the Lord. Much of the world will gather this Thursday and they'll give a vague head nod to thankfulness. They will have an attitude of gratitude, as they say. But gratitude to what? To who? To themselves? To each other? To karma? To what? Believers in the one true God give thanks to him, specifically. To him. We direct our joyful victory shouts to the one who has ordained the end from the beginning and who has known and numbered our days. The one who is named Yahweh God. I am who I am. The God who has condescended from eternal heights to make redemption and covenant with a hopeless and lost people. We should direct our thanks, our shouts to him. But not only should we, as if that wasn't hard enough, the buck doesn't stop with us. Believers, do you remember that the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Jeremiah, the God of Peter, James, and John, is the God of all the earth? This psalm directs all the earth to make a loud shout to the Lord. To the Lord. Verse 1, make a loud shout all the earth. No doubt this psalm was written by an Israelite. But God is not content to receive joyful shout of thanksgiving from one people only. He deserves joyful shouts from all peoples. This psalm is directed not merely to Israel, but to all peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations. Be encouraged, Eastridge. That includes us. We are a Gentile congregation, but we have reason for joy. This psalm is for us. The good news of victory in Christ is for us. This shout ought to be stirred up in our hearts because the Lord has come for us. Not only should this stir our hearts to glad shouting, but it should stir us up to, verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. And I love this because we're told that our knowledge of God should not only stir us up to serve, but to do it with gladness. Let's remember together, lest we forget, that this is not optional, right? This is a command in our text. These are in the imperative form, which is the command form of a verb. So make that loud shout to God. Make real effort to serve the Lord. Serving him here is the verb form of the noun slave. The idea here is to do everything that you do Everything that you do for God with an attitude of gladness. The Lord is the master and we are slaves to him and his righteousness if you are a born again believer. But the idea here is not just position before him, it's focusing in on the attitude of the thing. I mean, can you believe that? Did you know that God has authority over even your emotions? Did you know that God can tell you not only to serve him, but to do it with gladness? I love this because prior to Christ, I was a slave to my emotions. Weren't you? But now we are freed from that bondage to live happily under the bond of our Lord in gladness. This Thanksgiving and every day, I'm happy and I'm grateful that I am able 
to be glad in the Lord. And I'm happy and thankful that that is exactly where he wants me to be. He wants us to be glad, as evidenced by the command to be glad. Does that make you glad? The Lord wants your happiness. Christian, wherever you are and whatever you do, do everything to the glory of God, just as the Apostle Paul instructed us. But don't forget to do it with gladness, not a somber resignation to the thing, but with gladness. That brings God the glory that he deserves. And this means joy. Jubilation is the idea of the word. It's not dissimilar to the shout of joy, which we saw in verse 1. But this is not only shouting with joy, it's serving with joy. My beloved brothers and sisters, I'm looking out at a sea of servant-hearted brethren. Thank you for serving the Lord so well. Thank you for serving each other so well. We think about this psalm in its Old Testament context. The Old Testament saint would have sought to serve other Hebrews in their congregation. Much of their service would have been even ceremonial at the temple or the tabernacle. But for us as Gentiles, as new covenant believers under the law of Christ, we serve our God by serving the church, evangelizing the lost, helping the weak, admonishing the unruly, encouraging the faint-hearted brother and sister. And when we do love our neighbor as ourselves, we are serving the Lord. You remember, of course, when Jesus said in Matthew 25 that Whatever you do to one of these brothers of mine, brothers meaning believers, even the least of them, you did it for me. Can then you do that with gladness, church? Can you serve others with gladness? Can you do it with gladness even when serving is hard? Man, what a display of God's power when we can serve with gladness even when it's hard. It's not always easy, right? Sometimes when we're trying to serve one another, we end up actually just splashing up sin on each other. It gets messy. We all fall short of the glory of God in various ways and we end up sinning against one another. Sometimes, even at work, we're trying to maintain a Christ-like testimony and it's a challenge, and sometimes when we try even to serve in practical ways, it's not always easy. Even relationships in the church, they can be difficult. But even when it is hard, you can be glad. You can be glad because you are rendering that service not only to that other person, though you are. You are rendering that service to God. And he sees and he cares and he is pleased with that service. He's pleased. Even the unpublished and unseen services to the church, God sees and he rewards in secret. So let your service be with gladness. Let it be with gladness. And verse 2, come before him with joyful singing. Come before him with joyful singing. Come before him, meaning here, literally, come into his presence with joyful song. Come into his presence. Now, we're always in the presence of the Lord. I hope you know that. Psalm 139 says, You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven... You are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, end quote. There is nowhere we can go from the presence of of God. We are always in his presence. What's meant here in Psalm 100 
is to come into the presence of the Lord in the sense of deliberate worship. Deliberate worship. In other words, we must realize the presence of God and commune with him as our heavenly father and to so do and so think and so speak the things that are pleasing to him and to do it with joyful songs according to verse 2. Again, we are told to bring our emotions to the mat and rejoice with joyful songs. Again, I say rejoice. Have you ever been so happy that you could sing? That's the kind of joy we're talking about here. That is the kind of joy. Are you so filled up with the joy of being God's child that if someone were to shake you, joy would come spilling out? Is that your heart? I pray, I have prayed and do pray that joy, one of the very first in the list of the fruit of the Spirit, would be characteristic of Eastridge Baptist Church. Joy. From the level of the congregation down to the individual seat here this morning, I pray that you will be joyful in the Lord today, right now. According to the psalmist, here's how you do it. You need to, verse 3, know that Yahweh, the Lord, he himself is God. Knowing the Lord is the only way to have true, joyful shouts, serving with gladness and entering into his presence with joyful song. I say knowing God. I did not say knowing about God. Because the main thrust of verse 3 is ownership. So when I say knowing God, I mean relational. I know him. Verse 3, it is established that Yahweh is God. But it moves on rather quickly to his ownership of us as Lord and as our shepherd. First, the basics. Yahweh is God. You know that capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D is Yahweh in the original Hebrew. Or if you have an older Bible, it might say Jehovah. Yahweh is simply the Hebrew reference for the phrase, I am who I am. It points to the self-existing, self-defining nature of God. I am who I am. But more than that, God told his people to use this as his memorial name, according to Exodus 3.15. We're dealing not only with his self-existence, but this name is to be a reference to the sum total of all that God has revealed himself to be. It's shorthand for this is who I am. He uses the rest of the Bible to reveal who he is. And in our psalm, we're talking about how he, Yahweh, is God. Not some other God. Not some higher power that a 12-step program would sell you. Not Allah or Buddha, or karma, or mother nature. Not the God of the health, wealth, prosperity gospel, which is not a gospel. No, Yahweh, the God of the Bible, exactly as he has revealed himself, he is God. And he has authority over us. Not only is he God, but he is our creator. Verse 3, it is he who has made us. The Lord God of the Bible made us. He did it. Not an exploding speck billions of years ago. We did not crawl out of primordial sludge. The Lord made us. And the psalmist seems to know the human heart very well because he warns us in a way that I did not expect. When he says that God made us, he says, verse 3, and not we ourselves, God made us. We didn't make us. You might say, that's interesting. I did never think that I made me. <laughs> but if you would ascribe your existence to anyone or anything other than the Lord, 
It means that no one is master over you, which means you are master over you. It means that you can be master of your own ship, of your own life. But that is not how it worked out, beloved. Verse 3, God's creation of us is directly linked to his ownership of us. Woe to the so-called self-made man who thinks that he is master of his own fate. Because he will be lost. He'll be lost in a lie. It is those who know that they were made, fashioned, and loved by God in Christ. They are his people. They are the sheep of his pasture. Verse 3, we are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. And this is the crux of the issue. At this time, you might be saying, brother, I would love to shout joyfully to the Lord. I would love to serve the Lord with gladness. And I would love to come into his presence with joyful songs. But how do I train my heart to grow in that direction? Verse 3 tells us we do it by remembering. We do it by remembering that God made you and he knows you. And if you belong to him, if you are one of his people, one of the sheep of his pasture, then you will have much fuel for joy in your heart. If you are a blood-bought believer in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, let your heart well up with fresh remembrance that you belong to God, the God of all creation. The God of the universe is your tender, loving shepherd. When your heart is filled with that knowledge, there won't be room in your heart to contain it, and it will spill into shouts of joy and service and joyful singing. And those... Those are some fitting offerings to bring into the presence of the Lord. Are they not? Give yourself through service and worship to the Lord because he is God. And the second fitting offering to bring before the Lord we find in our text is this. Joyfully give thanks to the Lord because he is good. That one should actually say good. Joyfully give thanks to the Lord because he is good. Here we find even more commands, but even more reason to do them. These commands are fueled by more truth about God. Verse 4 tells us to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. This phrase we saw in verse 2, come into his presence that come into part is repeated here. Come into his gates. Come into his courts. This psalm of thanksgiving is about drawing near to the Lord. Consider the gates of the Lord. Consider the courts of the Lord. A psalm is a song sung by Israel. The book of Psalms is basically their corporate hymnal. For them, the gates would lead to the temple and the courts would surround the tabernacle or the temple. This was their way of drawing near to the Lord. For us, we draw near to him moment by moment. We don't go to the tabernacle. We do this by praying without ceasing, rejoicing always, seeking spirit-filled obedience to his word, and constant communication with the Lord as we pray to him and as we see his voice on the pages of the Bible. Now is different slightly from then. While the Israelites would have drawn near to the temple to corporately worship the Lord together as a people, now we draw near in a corporate assembly called the local church. And we worship him together on a day like today. 1 Corinthians was a letter written to a local church. And in chapter 6, verse 19, it says, Your, plural, Body, singular, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That does not mean that your individual body is a temple. The you, plural, means that the corporate body of Christ, the church body, 
is the united temple of the Spirit of God. The implication is that we come together on days like today, and when we do, it is a special thing to be with the local assembly. To be with the body of Christ is a blessing. It's a blessing to draw near in fellowship with God and with one another is a grace. And according to Psalm 100, we are to do it with thanksgiving. The Old Testament saint would have brought a thanksgiving sacrifice to the temple. And we don't bring an animal or incense or a grain offering. If you did, please keep it outside. (laughs) We don't come with those things. But we do bring true and genuine thanks. At least we ought to. We ought to enter these doors with thanksgiving and praise. Did you come with those things today? Again, the Lord commands us not only to draw near, but to do so with thanksgiving, to do so with praise. He commands our hearts again. It's said in verse 4 that we are to give thanks to him and to bless his name. When we consider the idea of giving thanks to God and blessing his name, what we're really saying is, Lord, you are right in all that you do. To give thanks, you have to recognize that what was given is right. To bless the name of the recipient of that thanks, we have to actually mean it with a whole heart. And where the heart is engaged, we often need to be shepherded, do we not? So when we hear the call to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, to give him thanks and to bless his name, we are left with the same exact challenge that we had earlier. A challenge to train our hearts in that direction so that we can fulfill our calling in this. And you are called to this. So how do we train our hearts towards thanksgiving? How do we train our hearts to praise God, to give thanks to him, to bless his name? Again, we must remember. We must remember what he has done for us and who he is. When we first considered verses 1 through 3 that the Lord, Yahweh, is God, our creator and our master, it fueled our glad service unto him. Now we consider that we ought to bring thanksgiving, praise, and the blessing of his name. We see that it is fueled by one simple fact. Our Lord is good. Verse 5. For the Lord, Yahweh, is good. I don't need to tell you that the word for means because in this sense. All these things because the Lord is good. What instruction we were previously given is now filled up and propelled by a knowledge of the goodness of our God. Not only is he our creator and our master, but he's a good master. There's a difference in having a master and having a good master. He is graciously benevolent to his people. He is faithful to the sheep of his pasture. I believe verse 5 statement, for the Lord is good, is explained by the two following statements. His loving kindness and his faithfulness are specific manifestations of his goodness. His loving kindness is everlasting. And this exact phrase, his Loving kindness is everlasting. This is not your first time hearing that this morning. (laughs) Or uh, the legacy standard says his loving kindness endures forever. This phrase, this exact phrase occurs verbatim in your Bible 43 times. Many of them in the psalm that Bill read. (laughs) But what that tells me, the sheer number of this phrase being repeated in your Bible, what that tells me is that this key phrase is pure gold for God's people to cling to when you're considering him. When you need to find reasons to give thanks, which is a common refrain in that psalm and in this psalm, 
we are told to cling to the fact that his loving kindness is everlasting. Loving kindness, the loving kindness of the Lord is a frequently used tool in the utility belt of a believer's life and faith. We're to call this to mind. Loving kindness is probably my favorite word in the Bible. It's, uh, it's the Hebrew word chesed, which is said with some phlegm in it. Um, <laughs> Your, your Bible might say steadfast love or kindness or love or mercy or loyal love. Different translations have used different um, translations of this. But the best rendering, I believe, is the word loving kindness. It means to compassionately do good to someone who is in a pitiable state. Hence, a loving kindness. But a kindness with action. It's not a state of emotion it's an action. In other part of the Bible's, in other parts of the Bible, writers would remember specific loving kindnesses, plural, of the Lord. Specific instances when his benevolent kind actions towards his people were made evident. It's much like our New Testament word for grace in that it came, comes with this idea of unmerited, actionable favor. And what we cling to to hear and allow to propel us to praise is that this loving kindness, this loving kindness of the Lord, it endures forever. It's everlasting. It indeed never ceases. A familiar verse, Lamentations 3.22, clearly says, the loving kindnesses of the Lord indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. And not only does that fact console us, as it does in Lamentations 3, but it also should bring praise and joy to believers, as it does in our psalm. When tempted to come to the gates and the courts of the Lord, empty of praise and thanks. When tempted to come empty-handed before the worthy God, remind yourself that his loving kindness towards you will endure into eternity future. Remember that he has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, Ephesians 1.3. Let that incite you to praise. Let that incite you to thanks. This Thanksgiving holiday, as you gather around your table or your relative's table, I hope that you give thanks to God for physical needs met. I hope that you give him thanks for breath in your lungs and a roof over your head. But I hope that you give him thanks for the grace, the loving kindness in Christ. The greatest grace gift anyone could ever give. Your salvation, which was purchased at the greatest price imaginable. I, pref- I, I pray that, that you would reflect on the kindness of God in Christ, and that you will make a loud shout in your heart with gladness. And what's more, I pray that you bring thanks and blessing to his name in front of those who gather around you. Because God is not merely one who shows loving kindness to you. He does. He does. But this psalm ends with a promise. His faithfulness is literally generation unto generation. God will not change. That is a promise. His faithfulness is generation unto generation. The same undeserved kindness that he showed to you in Christ, he will show to any who call upon his name and lift up the cup of salvation in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This psalmist, and therefore God, who inspired this text, is concerned about you, the reader, yes, but he's also concerned about the next generation. When you gather around your table, tell it to the next generation. Tell them of the joy that can be had in the family of God. Gather for the glory of Christ in the gospel and in the kingdom of God because the next generation receives the same offer you did. And today, if you have not yet trusted the Lord for your rescue and your redemption yet, today 
You can share in his unmerited grace in Christ. You can enter into the sheepfold of his pasture. He is faithful. He will surely do it. Praise God for that. Really, praise God for that. Let's thank him together. Father, thank you. Lord, we stand in awe that you are the one true holy God. And you would condescend to make your loving kindness and your faithfulness to rest on us. Who are we that you're even mindful of us? And yet, Lord, you're staggering in the abundance of your love. Thank you. Thank you. Help us. Help us to give you the praise and the thanks that you deserve. Instruct our hearts. Bend our wills to match yours, that we would be refined and conformed to your image, giving you praise and glory and honor. Father, you've made us. We belong to you. We don't own ourselves. You own us. Thank you for that, because you're a good God. You're a loving master. You're a good shepherd. And Lord, we trust you. So help us, even as we go into this week and enjoy uh, the many common graces of a holiday week, uh, Lord, help us to give specific and pointed prayer and thanks to you. Um, Lord, we pray that you would strengthen our testimony in our lives, that we would live holy lives as an offering to you, and that we would also, Lord, proclaim your excellencies to those around us, friends and family who come to visit. Lord, would we make known the glory of Christ to them through sharing the gospel. Pray that you would soften hearts, save our precious family and friends. Lord, we pray that you would amass an army of worshipers for your name into eternity. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.